Good day, Nadia. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Um, we've only met virtually online when you asked me to speak to one of your classes at Concordia University. I think that's because of our um, connection regarding Richard E. Clark. But uh, you've moved on to a new job recently, and so can you start out by sharing with us something about that? First, introduce yourself, tell us where you live and where you work and what you're currently doing. Yeah, so thank you so much for having me. Yeah, uh, I, I, I discovered you when I was actually looking for something about Richard Clark, and I, I found your video and the interview that you did with him. And since then, I've been... Uh, maybe stalking you and, uh, you know, like following everything that you do. So, uh, and you've been introducing me for so many, like to many people from uh, our field through the work that you're doing. So thank you so much. And I need to tell you that I'm super humbled by the fact that you asked me to be interviewed, you know, like with all these people that I admire. So thank you for having me. So my name is Nadia Nafi. I'm uh, now an assistant professor in the education technology program. Uh, at Université Laval in Quebec City, uh, in Canada. And I hold the chair in education and leadership on the sustainable transformation of pedagogical uh, practices in digital context. And this is a chair uh, that is funded by uh, the National Bank here um, in Canada. Um, so originally I'm from Lebanon. I grew up there. I did my BA in interior design. I worked there as an art teacher for 14 years, and uh, I was also graphic designer, lead graphic designer uh, there. Uh, but at some point in 2008, I had to leave. I had to take my family and come to Canada because, you know, like most of us, we we leave the country that we love, but we, we want a, a, a future that is safer for our kids. So I came to Canada. I started my master's in education technology at Concordia. Uh, I worked as an instructional designer, and then I went back and I did my uh, my PhD there too in education technology. Again, at the same university with uh, with the same uh, supervisor. Um, so some of the work that I've been maybe I can share uh, about the, the work that I did in my master's and then my project in the PhD uh, uh, research. Uh, for my master's, I focused on uh, trying to understand what do youth learn uh, through their interaction on social media. You know, the, all the informal um, accidental learning. I've been a proponent of the use of social media, being online, having an online presence, using all the features and all the tools that we have online to connect, to learn, to, you know, to, to the world is open to us online. And we have all this resistance that is happening in schools and education settings and even within families about, you know, like all the risks that we have on social media. So I was one of the proponent of or the advocate of, OK, we have the risk. We have to be aware of the risk. We have to be aware that, yes, our data is being used, that, you know, like all the algorithm with AI and all of that are putting us in bubbles. But that doesn't make us um, stop using these tools because of that. You have to be critical about them. You have to use them ethically, responsibly, but we, we have, we can use them. And, you know, so for my master's, I looked at how uh, youth were learning online. So, and the results of my um, my study showed that not only they have to you to learn how to exist online, so how to use all these, um, you know, like the features, but they had to learn to exist online because their life was offline online and all the social aspect all of you know how to protect themselves how to be part of their community of the you know like so it's really a two um, aspect of learning to exist in this in this world for my um phd research i really used what i learned or the um, the competencies i i developed as um, a performance consultant structure designer and i looked at the integration of refugees uh, from our field's perspective so i looked at it as a, a performance issue um you know um when the Syrian refugee uh, crisis happened we had this disruption worldwide and while everyone and every country was looking at how we can prepare uh, these newcomers, these new refugees to integrate into their new environment. Uh, so whether it was training, language training, training them to be part of the culture and etc. No one was actually looking at or rarely we looked at the whole society that was welcoming them. 
And as a performance consultant, we know that it's, you know, like we're part of a system and it happens to, for a performance to, to be achieved. It's, it's really on different levels, different, you know, like you have different variables. Um, and just training these newcomers won't be enough if the welcoming community doesn't accept them or view them or perceive them as terrorists, as rapists. You know, like how can I work with someone uh, I'm afraid uh, of, right? Or I see that they are a threat uh, to my to my to my country, to my family, etc. So what I did is that I wanted again I focus on youth and I interviewed youth all over the world, like from Canada, from Europe, from the Middle East. Uh, I did hundreds of, of, of meetings, of interviews with them uh, to understand how they viewed their role in the integration and the, the inclusion of refugees in a context where the image of refugees was deeply influenced by all the social media propaganda online. And through our work, um, and I use tools coming from or stemming from personal contact psychology, um, and through my work and through meeting with them and discussing with them, I engage them in this disruptive pedagogy where they question their construct, they question their behavior, they question why um, they were part of this, you know, like they were passive bystanders instead of being active um, in this process online. Um, and do you have this shift of performance where now they, the people like that, the youth that I worked with, they, uh, they realized that they had a role to play uh, more actively online to change or to give um, viewers or readers or anyone who's using social media another um, side of the story and give them more arguments. So people who are simply, you know, users of social media, but they are not part of any of the groups, they can have an informed opinion about uh, these newcomers. And the work that I did was, again, I looked at it as a performance issue. And it was adapted to other contexts where we are faced with whoever we call the other. Um, and the model that stemmed from my research is used now in France, in many schools in France, for countering cyberbullying. So it was really, um, again, looking at at a performance issue and trying to solve them from our perspective. So while working on this research, um, on my research, I I taught uh, online at the Ontario Tech University and the BA in Education Studies and Digital Technologies program uh, using problem-based learning approach. And I love this experience. I taught there for four years uh, because in a problem-based learning approach, you don't use content. So it was really about designing the learning experience where your, um, your learners, they have to be autonomous and they have to solve problems and they have to learn through this experience instead of just feeding them content and you don't know what they will happen right uh, after. So it's, it wasn't uh, just that. And for the last couple of years, I taught at Concordia and the Education Technology Program. Uh, at the master's degree, um, I taught uh, the core courses, so um, instructional design and uh, human performance technology. I taught some courses, some elective courses like uh, intro to dist distance ed, um, digital uh, media, uh, etc. So I started as a limited term appointment and then when I got my PhD, I became an assistant professor there. There till I got this amazing opportunity at Université Laval where I'm joining now the education technology team. I've been here for two months now, discovering this new uh, this new city and this new environment. And they're in the process of um, revamping their education technology program to meet this uh, 21st century AI era uh, where we need to prepare our instructional designers to design for this era. So I'm very happy to uh, to be part of this uh, this movement now. Yes. Well, the work you did for your PhD is very noble work indeed. Thank you for doing that. And so can you, if we're going to include uh, your LinkedIn profile contact information, um, can people search that to find out more about that particular work? Yes, yes. So I, I again, I'm a proponent, like I, I advocate for social media and I share my stuff everywhere. So the even my the link to my website is also on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So from LinkedIn, they can have access to all the work that I've been doing. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And I would really love to discuss this with people. So please connect, connect, connect. <laughs> yes, of course. Walk that talk. 
Can you can you tell us a little bit about your first exposure to HPT, human performance technology, or evidence-based practices for performance improvement, or however you in particular refer to all of that? Yeah. So, as I told you, when I was, you know, like trying to find a master degree, uh, when, I, when I came to Canada, I was looking at education because I was teaching art, I was in education. So even though I have my degree in interior design, I, I was more towards uh, teaching and, and learning and etc. And by pure accident, I saw online a, a course outline of the HPT course that was given at Concordia. And I fell in love immediately because it was presented in a very structured way where it explained how HPT um, analyzes, you know, like how through HPT we analyze the performance and we can find solutions, whether instruction, non-instruction solutions. But it, it described it in a way where I was like, oh my God, this is exactly what I want to do. You know, like I want to help people through, you know, like I want to understand and find ways to understand what's going on and try to find solutions to help them better perform. So that was like, I applied to different universities and I was accepted in different programs, but this uh, course outline drove me towards Concordia. So I went there and the first course that I took was HPT. And it was given by an amazing professor. Her name is uh, Dr. Anne Louise Davidson. And I've been working with her for the last 10 years now. And she gave this amazing course where it was a six credit course over two semesters. We started with a problem that we needed to solve through training, of course. And then after the Christmas uh, vacation, she comes back in our class and she says, your training program was very well designed. It was really, you know, like it was excellent. However... The performance issue was issue was not solved, so now we have to move from a systematic perspective to a systemic uh, perspective and examine all the different factors within the system that are actually preventing your performance from performing. And that was like, oh my god! It was you know like so it was great. Um, and in addition to the amazing experience through this course, uh, Anouis. Um, introduced within her course uh, some aspects from Gary Boyd's um, way of uh, looking at uh, HPT. Gary Boyd was one of the founders of our EdTech program at, at Concordia. And he passed away before I had the chance to, um, to take a course with him, but he was teaching education cybernetics. And he was advocating for all the, you know, like when you design interventions and you think about your performers, you have to think about your design in a way that is ethical, responsible, uh, critical, thinking about the human being that you're designing for. So your client could be, you know, like the client who's your sponsor, but your real, like the people for whom you're really designing who will be impacted by your designs, there are these human beings that you have to, they have to be your priority. Uh, and she had this in her classes. So we were designing with Gary Boyd in our, in our you know, like the background. Um, and that pushed me to read more about his work. And one of the things that he, he, um, he mentioned in one of his, his articles, uh, he talks about technology, for example. And he says, uh, technology is, is like a knife. Uh, you can use it to carve something beautiful or you can use it to kill or harm someone. And that goes back to what I, how I view social media, right? And all the different technology that we're using and the emerging technologies that we are using, even with AI, right? With AI, you can use AI with all the, the drones and, you know, like the facial recognition uh, features and you can target people and kill them. Or you can use AI for making humanity better and help, you know, like in all the different fields that we are now using AI for or hoping to use AI for. So... You know, you have all this aspect that was within this course that uh, confirmed the fact that this is exactly what I wanted to do. And this is why I did my master's and my PhD in education technology. And, I've been, and I've been, I will be teaching that again and again and researching that. So, Excellent. Well, besides the people that you've already referenced, are there any additional people or articles or books that you would point others to? to get more background in this? Yeah, so one of the main models that I like I used in my research and I teach over and over again is uh, Richard Swanson's um, 
uh, model, the, the analysis uh, model, the performance diagnosis matrix of enabled question, enabling questions. Um, and the book that is my, like, it's next to me all the time is the analysis for improving performance. And I used his, his model, again, to, um, to look at different performance issues, but mainly for my performance, uh, for my PhD, I looked, I, um, I uh, applied it to the integration system, right, and the to integration performance. So, for example, he has, um, he has different variables, right, and, uh, and levels. So for the levels, he has the mission, uh, the, um, sorry, the, the organization, I'm just going to go back here. Yes, yeah, so to make sure that I'm not missing any point here. So the organization level, the process, the team level, the individual level. And I transformed this into, instead of having the organization, I looked at the government. Instead of process level, I looked at uh, the integration inclusion process level. Instead of the team, I looked at the society. And instead of the, you know, simply the individual, I looked at the newcomer. So his model is, is, or the matrix is very adaptable to any context. And it really goes into all these different intersections and have all the different questions that don't really miss questions when you're examining uh, performance issues. So this is something that I really encourage people to look at, uh, people from our field. I loved um, Peter Senge's uh, system thinking and his work on that. And I've been using... From the beginning, uh, Stolovich and, and keeps training in performance. That's, again, another, you know, light bulb when you, you know, it's not only like training doesn't mean that you're immediately solving all the problems. Mm-hmm. So these are three main books that, or main authors that I really encourage people to look at Thank or you. examine. Thank you for sharing that. If uh in order to provide others with models or examples, if, if you were to give a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, how do you present that? What do you say? So, in a nutshell, what I do and my focus now is on how to prepare instructional designers, learning experience designers, performance consultants to thrive in an AI era where the future is uncertain. So our instructional designers, they have to be prepared to thrive there, to be able to use the technology that is emerging in an ethical, responsible, critical way. But at the same time, we have another level. We have to prepare them to design learning experiences to learners who must thrive in this AI era, who will be working with machines. And So this is what I do. I prepare. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to I'm say hoping, than do. I'm but- Right, like this is this is a huge challenge when you're faced with a future that is uncertain, that is moving, that is. You need to start to understand what's coming, and nobody's actually, you know, like oh, like they. We still don't know what's what will happen, so it's a huge challenge. Very true. This is a nice segue into my next question, which is, what is your current focus or next focus for your own learning as a lifelong learner? Are, are you are you working on anything in particular? Are you writing about it? What, what can you share with us? So, uh, first of all, I will be writing about the models that I discussed. You know, like the the the, the model that, um, uh, that stem from my my thesis. But my uh, my research now is really focused on understanding um, again this this future, the future of work, uh, because for for me to be able to to, uh, to prepare instructional designers, I need to understand how and what are the different competencies that I need to help them develop and how I can prepare them to, to the best way I can. So I'm collaborating with AI ecosystems here in Quebec and Montreal and worldwide. I'm looking at, you know, like when I go to conferences about AI, I notice that you know, like all the organizations or all the tech guys are the ones who are talking about education and training. And we don't really have the voice, our voice in these conferences. And we need to have a voice. But in order to have a voice, we need to understand. So I've been, you know, like humans plus machines, <laughs> stuff like that. You know, like these are books that I've been looking at. So before I start actually, you know, like writing, I have to understand. I, so my goal for the like for the coming months is really to to network to um to talk with people to really get what's coming and um and start doing my research on that so 
what's coming is really the writing that I will be um, focusing on is clarifying or shedding or putting some light on uh, what is expected in all the different uh, fields and how we must be ready for that and how we can be ready for that. Thank you. Shifting gears here a bit, is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? I ask this question because sometimes we're not happy with how a term or a phrase is being used in our field and we would like to put our own spin on it. What do you have for us? So can I give you a word that is not being used in our field, sure. but it could be interesting? Again, because I was um, I was influenced by the thoughts and the work of Gary Boyd, despite the fact that I never met him, uh, I would really love to share with you a, a term that he coined, uh, and it's uh, synviability. So it's S-Y-M-V-I-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y, synviability. And I'm going to simply um, read the definition that he has in one of, of his articles. And it says, synviability is defined most simply as eco-local culture symbiosis as a long-term commitment together, consider considerately with each other and all the rest of Earth life. More precisely, it is to be commitment to symbiosis between all major human cultures and the biological flora and fauna on, uh, of Earth, and a long-term commitment to symbiosis among all of the major human cultures. The main thing that this implies is that wherever there is an appreciable power or intelligence differential uh, between living identity systems, the stronger shall, uh, shall wisely modify itself to attenuate its reproductive activity some what so as to maintain the ability of the weaker. And why I think that this is something that is really important as performance consultant or instruction designers, again, we're designing for humans. And our role is not simply to help them develop this knowledge or this skill or whatever, right? It's really about, we have, our role is bigger than that. And if we can, through our designs, through the experiences that we're designing, to help them not only develop knowledge and skills, but also develop the way to, for them to collaborate with each other, to accept each other, to be part of, of the team, of the society, of, you know, like, and have a role, that would be wonderful, you know? Well, thank you, yes. Uh, very, very important in this, in this world here where we're all networked and we need to learn how to collaborate and we're gonna have to be able to deal with differences and exactly. be appreciative and respectful of Mother Earth. Thank you. Let's explore a little bit about some of the additional people uh, that have influenced you. And, and I shared my questions with you before we did this. And what I'm looking for is some stories about your interactions with others, whether they're known in the field or not. Maybe you want to give some credence to or some respect, uh, show your respect to others who have uh, had influence on you. But we discussed this and you're going to talk about a couple of people here. So what personal or professional stories can you share with us? So I have two stories to share with you. The first one um, is how, you know, like my, the, the meeting that I had with Richard Clark. And it really touched me a lot because when, so what happened is that I wanted to know about him. I watched the video, the interview that you did with him. That gave me some courage to actually connect uh, with him. So I sent him a message on LinkedIn and he was amazing. He responded and, you know, like I was new in the field and he was like, oh my God, you know, like Richard Clark. And he answered me. It was, it was a big thing uh, for me. But the thing is that during the same period, I was diagnosed, uh, diagnosed uh, anyways, I, I, like, I, I knew that I had cancer and I was going through the treatment and he, so between the treatments, I did my interview with him and he was supposed to give me 10 minutes. He stayed with me for an hour and at the end, I don't know how, like it came, I told him that I was going through my, my cancer treatment. And he, he was super supportive, but not only that, after this, he actually continued sending me messages and making sure that I was okay. And so, you know, 
when again when we talk about people who are new to our fields especially you know like young who come and they see these big names and we don't see them as humans we see them as you know like these gurus these people who are but at the end they are very humane and they are they are caring and they are approachable and Richard Clark gave me this you know like he gave me this confidence of of or he made me also feel included in in this field uh, through the attention and the caring that he gave me so not only you know like doing the interview but doing the follow up after so i really that that touched me and it's still you know like i still have all these um, things like the feelings when when i think about that so if i can thank him every single day i i would, I would but then he would think that i'm <laughs> lurking him or so, you know stalking him so <laughs> This is one one big story. The other one, uh, when I was doing my uh, my doctor studies, I I I I I like to look at other fields and what they do, um, and learn from other fields. So you know, like because the things that you might learn a lot of from all the different ways of looking at stuff from other perspectives, right? Um, so I discovered um, my theoretical framework was personal contact psychology, and I discovered the work of Harry Proctor, and he has uh, this um, element perceiver, perceiver element grid, where uh, you use it with your participants to help them uh, reflect on how they per- perceive um, the other, or how they perceive an event, or how they perceive an object, right? And how they think others perceive them. So it help them reflect on their construct system and realize like where their uh, ideas and where their position is coming from and that helps a lot in if you want to have this change you know like we have all these attitudes and all so when people start learning about themselves and where their ideas and their positions are coming from um, they start to become critical of of that Um, so I I share my stuff always, like everything that I do, I share online. So I shared my the work and how I um, I was adopting his grid. I shared that on research uh, research gates, and one day he sent me a message and he's like, "Oh, Natya, like I saw your work and I'm super impressed by that. And uh, would you like to come and present it in Italy?" And I'm like, "Oh my God, Harry <laughs> Proctor." <laughs> Like again, like similar to Richard Clark, you know, like Harry Proctor wants, like he's he's impressed by the work that I did with his, you know, like his creation, and he wants me to go to Italy to present. So I actually took my tools and I went to Italy and he introduced me to all these, you know, like psychologists there, and they gave me feedback. And again, it was, you know, like when you think that they are not approachable or they are, you know, like these big gurus, they're actually very interested in in helping and collaborating and and being part of journey you know um, so this is again a lesson that I learned and I I would really like they made me encourage my student and everyone I've worked with to actually you know like interact with these people you know like because we think that they're for but in reality what they do is really part of of the movement and be part of of helping and really in our field so um well, excellent, yeah. excellent stories. Yes, we're in a very, we're in a field where people are there to help others. And you know, it was yeah. my experience, the tradition I grew up in at NSPI, now ISPI, was that you could walk up to anybody and ask them a question and they would be glad to help you. Uh, I never found anybody um, that, that wouldn't be like that. But uh, thank you for sharing those stories with us. Um, as a, kind of a wrap up to our interview here, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially those who are new to the field? And of course, you work with people that are new to the field or just enter, beginning to enter the field uh, related to all things performance improvement wise. What, what guidance would you share with them? So, um, you know, the first thing that I would say and something that helped me a lot is being online and connect and network. Right. So the thing is that, you know, like I discovered you through YouTube and that was a huge discovery for me. And it changed the way I saw things and how, you know, like having you in my classes gave another perspective to my students. So the thing is that but I, I couldn't have done that 
if I wasn't on YouTube and we connected, right? So this huge opportunity that I had and my students have of meeting you was because of being online and, you know, like try to connect. So I would strongly encourage people to connect, to, to, to network, to be online, to share, you know, and you don't have to be afraid of sharing the things that we have to be open to have all this discussion and, you know, like getting into conversations because this is how we evolve through interacting and having, you know, this exchange of arguments and etc. So this is one thing. The other thing is always remember training and performance. So, so yeah, we need to focus on developing knowledge. I, I saw today, you know, knowledge doesn't mean that you can actually do it. Sometimes you have to develop the skill and etc. And this is even not enough thing as that is preventing performance. So we have to keep this in mind that, you know, like the solution could be bigger and, and more um, complex that uh, we think. And my last message is that we have to keep in mind that we're touching human beings' lives with every decision we make. And what I tell my students is that, you know, like you design a training program, let's say, or an intervention, whether it's an in, in instruction or non instruction for human beings to perform. So these human beings, whether they are employees or any, you know, like members of our society, they need to perform. If they can't perform, that could create anxiety to them or they can, you know, like they can be stressed. And they won't leave this at work. They will go back to their families. They will be stressed with their family. They won't be able to perform within their family. They may might be, you know, like couldn't give, give time to their kids because they can't really perform. So our work doesn't stop at this training program that we're designing. It has a bigger implication. It's like, you know, so we're changing lives and we're amazing. <laughs> like, I think our role is huge. Um, so we have to do it responsibly, ethically, and very critically when uh, we are making decisions. Thank you. And that's it. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you so much for doing this again. And uh, um, I, I, you, did, you talked about that you had cancer. Are you in remission? Are you, is, where are you with that? I'm cancer-free. It's been uh, since 2014, and now I'm... I'm cancer-free. I'm, I have my scar, and I'm super proud of my scar. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Well, thank you. Well, good. Thank good. you for asking. Yes. Well, thank you so much again for doing this, and, uh, and good luck with all your endeavors in, in their new role at the new university. Thank you. Thank you.